So it is my pleasure to welcome Joseph Cunningham, who will tell us something about eigenpath transversal. Um, okay, thank you everyone for coming. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about eigenpath traversal and in particular doing it with uh, Poisson distributed phase randomization. This is joint work with my supervisor, Jeremy Roland, and the paper, if you want more information, is in the proceedings. So I will tell you, I will define what I mean by uh, eigenpath traversal, uh, then tell you a bit about phase randomization, which is something that existed in our doing something, uh, maybe it needs to be closer. Okay, is that better? No. Yeah. easier okay great thank you um so yeah into it so what's the basic setup um suppose you have a path of hamiltonian so you, you have a parameter going from zero to one and you have uh, for each value of that parameter you have a hamiltonian uh, and suppose you start in a state you have a system that's in a state uh, that is an eigenstate of the like starting hamiltonian then the question is can we kind of track the corresponding eigenstate as the Hamiltonian changes along the path. Uh, so like for all values of the parameter, can you like modify the, uh, the state that you started with such that you stay close to a eigenstate of the Hamiltonian at each point along the path? Um, and there are a number of like procedures that do this. The most famous, of course, being adiabatic quantum computing. That's the whole idea. Um, behind it, you add to quantum computing, and then you use that to build algorithms to solve problems, right? But there are another number of other procedures that do something very similar. Um, so one way is with measurement. Uh, instead of kind of relaxing down into the eigenstate by time evolution, you can relax into the eigenstate by projective measurement. That's uh, another way of doing that. Um, or you can use phase randomization, and this is a procedure that has been developed before and uh, is maybe less well known than the other two, but is a very interesting. Um, and we will be building on this phase randomization. Um, so some kind of pros and cons of the existing methods. Um, adiabatic quantum computing obviously has been very successful. It's very nice, it's very intuitive, but actually implementing it can be difficult. Um, so, of course, there are machines that implement it. If you go to D-Wave and you buy their machine, their machine kind of implements that. The disadvantage is that they only implement it for like specific uh, time-dependent evolutions. Um, so you can't pick any initial and final Hamiltonian that you want, and you can't do any kind of path in between, but you can do certain paths in between. Um, on the other hand, if you want to do this kind of thing, so you want to do a kind of the analog of... Uh, adiabatic quantum computing on a conventional quantum computer, you run into discretization errors. Uh, and these are typically not negligible. Um, on the other hand, what's nice about adiabatic quantum computing is that you have these nice kind of continuous evolutions. And so you have discrete, like, so, sorry, you have um, uh, like differential equations and you can solve your differential equations. You can get an adiabatic theorem. And based on this adiabatic theorem, uh, you get nice results that are typically relatively easy to analyze. Um, and in fact, they're so kind of nice that, that often even in kind of discrete algorithms, uh, the underlying intuition somehow comes from an adiabatic evolution. Uh, and so we want to be able to do the main idea then is to be able to preserve these nice features of adiabatic quantum computing while moving to kind of operationally a more discrete picture, uh, such that you don't have these extra discretization errors. Um, and so what's the, the idea here? The idea is to, like, given this path that kind of exists abstractly, you want to sample along the path, pick a number of Hamiltonians, and then for each Hamiltonian in turn, you kind of want to nudge the system into or close to the eigenstate, uh, like towards the eigenstate that you're interested in. Um, and so the major new aspect of this work is that it's, we pick the Hamiltonians according to a stochastic process. And because you 
pick the Hamiltonians according to a stochastic process, uh, and if you marginalize then over your, over your like stochastic choice, what you get is a nice continuous differential equation for which you can write down uh, an adiabatic theorem and for which you, you, you can analyze in the way that you're uh, familiar. So said, the new element is this uh, stochastic picking of the Hamiltonians, uh, but then you actually need to like do the kind of discrete nudging operation. And for this nudging operation, we've chosen to use uh, phase randomization, which is an existing technique. Um, and th so the basic idea is this. So given you've picked one of those Hamiltonians, you want to nudge your system into the eigenstate or close to the eigenstate, um, which here is uh, given by the P. Um, and the delta, the gap, is the distance between the target eigenvalue and the closest rest of the spectrum. Uh, so like typically, your omega zero here would be the ground state, um, and then the gap would be like the first excited state. Um, but we're not making the assumption uh, that we want to go to the ground state. We might want to go to a particular state of interest that's kind of in the middle of the spectrum somewhere. And everything works in kind of the same way. Um, then we assume that we can do uh, time independent ev evolution of this Hamiltonian. Uh, and so this is a relatively kind of mild assumption in the sense that you can do this on a conventional quantum computer, right? So this is kind of operationally, this shouldn't be too hard to do. Um, and notice that we have a cost model where the cost of doing this operation is T. And so you may be wondering, okay, but you can't actually do that on a quantum computer because you can't perfectly uh, perform this Hamiltonian simulation. And, uh, and you know, then people will talk about uh, the, the, the cost model in, being in terms of uh, numbers of applications of uh, block encoded the Hamiltonians or something like that. Uh, and I won't tell you much about that, only that it, like it works. So all of the complexities I'm going to uh, show here are in terms of the time t, the time complexities, but you can translate them to query complexities to compare it with the rest of the literature. Uh, and, you know, there are some details about how to do that in the paper, but I won't really talk much about that here. Um, and so then finally we get to the nudging operation. All we're doing is we're doing some kind of uh, randomized time evolution and the nudging operation, what does it do? Well, it essentially kills the off diagonal blocks. Uh, so your density matrix is, is kind of projected into, like you have the eigenspace parts and the completely away from eigenspace parts of the off diagonal coherences are killed. Um, so that was the uh, that, that was the kind of the discrete procedure that you do, um, and so the extra ingredient here is the fact that it's done according to a Poisson process. So what? Uh, so we start with a Poisson process, uh, which is essentially a number of clicks. You 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 jump at certain points along your path, um, but randomly, right? So when you actually, like in practice, want to run your algorithm, you pick a Poisson, you, you pick a re realization of the Poisson process, and then at the point where it tells you, you, you do this operation. Um, and so like, okay, formally, this is what the algorithm says. You, you pick your Poisson process, and then at every point you uh, do this uh, phase randomization. Uh, then what you can do is you can write down a stochastic differential equation, so whenever you have a jump in your Poisson process. You also have a change in the density matrix, of course, because you do something at jumps. You don't do anything in between jumps. Uh, and what happens is exactly this. You have this time evolution uh, is the kind of new thing and the old thing you subtract away. Marginalizing over the different realizations of the Poisson process give you this nice stochastic differential equation, um, which you can rewrite in the following form. Now. Notice that this is somehow has similarities to the normal Schrodinger equation down here. Uh, and so in adiabatic quantum computing, essentially what you want to do is you want to take this T here to be very large. And so if you take it large enough, then you will track the eigenstate relatively well, hopefully. And the same here, you have the same, which is the lambda. Now the lambda is the rate at which the Poisson process clicks. So the higher the rate, uh, the more clicks you have, so the, the more nudging operations you do. And uh, kind of morally, you have exactly an, an exact equivalence between the two cases. Like, um, just like you want larger t um, in the adiabatic case, but of course, the larger the t, the longer the time and the less efficient your algorithm is. Same here, the 
higher your rate, the more like operations you have to do, so the less efficient your algorithm is, but the better the fidelity is at the end. And so then you want to kind of like work out what's the optimal kind of trade-off between those two things. Um, so the next point is to say, okay, given that we've done that, how long has this taken us? So we, we've taken a realization um, of the Poisson process. And so at a number of points, we've done something and this doing this something takes an amount of time. And so you add all of those things up um, or you take the integral to be more precise. And this gives you an expression for the amount of time you've spent uh, on your algorithm. And now the final kind of element of all of the elements that I'm trying to bring together into a, a final algorithm is like an actual guarantee that doing this procedure will get you close enough to your target state. Uh, and this is, so you can think of this as an adiabatic uh, theorem. This is the adiabatic theorem that, that tells you somehow that if you take a good enough rate function lambda, that the fidelity that you get, or the infidelity rather, is more than enough. And okay, so if you know something about adiabatic quantum computing, maybe you know that the gap is a very relevant parameter. And I haven't said anything about the gap here, uh, but rather I've, I've got this strange thing with um, derivatives of, of the eigenprojector in some way. Um, and actually the link is relatively straightforward. Uh, you can just bound one by the other. And that's how you get these bounds in terms of the gap. Uh, it, it, this is exactly the same thing as for the adiabatic, the kind of standard adiabatic theorem. Okay, so I've laid out a number of different elements of the algorithm, uh, but before putting them all together into one big theorem and give you, you some like concrete results, I'm going to introduce two problems um, that we can use to kind of benchmark this uh, proposal. Um, the first is simple, Grover search. I'm sure everybody is well aware. Uh, so we have, you know, we have this projector on some subspace uh, spans by computational basis base states, um, and we start in the uniform superposition. And so you kind of interpolate between a Hamiltonian where the ground state is this uniform superposition and a ground state where um, any element in, like any target element is a ground state. Um, and then the other problem that I'm going to be talking about is the quantum linear systems problem, um, where essentially you want to solve a uh, linear system of equations uh, in a kind of quantum way. And so it's okay, there's a couple of things like you, you're not really finding a solution, you're, you're creating a quantum state that encodes a solution and it's of course normalized and all the rest of it, but that's basically the idea. And then I'm not, I'm not going to tell you anything about the exact path that you need to follow uh, to solve this, uh, but suffice it to say that there is a path that has been um, analyzed in the literature. And essentially we don't need to know very much about the path. All we need are a couple of spectral guarantees and based on those spectral guarantees, we can fill them in in the theorems and we get a complexity. So, uh, what is the spectral information that we need? It's basically a bound on the gap. So, okay, side note, whenever I say gap in this talk, what I really mean is a bound on the gap. Uh, we don't need to know any like explicit calculations of exactly how big the gap is. As long as we have a bound, the better the bound, typically the better the algorithm. But um, you, you, so long as you know something about the gap, it will give you a, uh, a correct algorithm. Um, so, Okay, you've got, these are gaps uh, for kind of typical instances of both problems. Uh, here, gap kappa is the condition number of the matrix A, so kind of typically the uh, larger kappa, the kind of more difficult the problem is. Um, the M and the N for Grover, M is the number of states that you can accept, N is the number of total states. Um, and now there is one feature that is interesting, that this kind of, you can immediately see if you look at the two plots of the gaps there, um, is that you have this kind of kind of straight line approximation. Uh, so like if you, if you squint hard and you, you, you'll see that essentially we're dealing with straight lines and then you have a bit at the bottom that's small and for the rest you have straight lines. Um, and what's interesting about that is if you take integrals of powers of one over the gap, if you think of delta as just like being S, right? It's just something that's linear. Then uh, at the end you get uh, one over the p to the minus one, you, you reduce the order, right? You're just taking an integral of one over uh, x to the p gives you one over x to the p minus one. Um, and so that holds for kind of the straight line segments. And it also holds for the gap, like the little, the, the bits, of, sorry, oops, um, the kind of bits of the middle, the bits close to the minimal gap, uh, because they are relatively short. 
And so like, putting all of that together, you get this basic feature. Um, and this feature is going to be very important to show that uh, the algorithms are optimal. Okay, so Grover is relatively simple. I'm sure, assuming everybody kind of knows what it, what it is. Um, quantum linear systems is a more complicated problem, uh, and there is a bit of a longer history in uh, trying to solve it optimally. Um, so there's the HHL algorithm, which is kind of the first attempt at, at solving it. And then you have various other improvements um, that have kind of been, uh, so yeah, so various other improvements over the years uh, with the optimal uh, kind of optimal scaling in Kappa uh, given uh, with a method originally, originally given using the discrete adiabatic theorem, which is a kind of another thing that looks uh, adiabatic, right? Uh, and then also here, the previous uh, attempt before that used the randomization method, but not this stochastic randomization method. And so what they got was they got in Kappa, but they had an extra log, log Kappa factor. And so basically part of our contribution here is to say, well, if you do this uh, stochastic process, you have a you, you have kind of a more continuous dial that you can tune, and with this more continuous um, dial, uh, you can kind of nudge your uh, your um, your rate in such a way that you can kind of tune away the log kappa. Um, okay, so this is uh, a first big theorem. Here now we're assuming that the rate is constant. So assume you pick a constant rate. Um, and then, okay, just filling everything and putting all of the elements that I've talked about together, um, you'll, uh, you'll see that the algorithm is correct if your uh, rate is larger than this number. Uh, and then you have a uh, time complexity of this. And so you can work out what the actual time complexity is for these particular problems. For Grover, you get something that's not quite optimal. And this is to be expected because we know that adiabatic Grover without um, an adaptive schedule is also not optimal. And in fact, this is slightly better than the adiabatic case because in the adiabatic case, you get uh, N over M without the square root. And here at least you get the square root, but you also get a lock factor. Uh, something relatively similar happens for the quantum linear systems problem is you get kappa and then but you also have the log kappa. Uh, but we can go a step further because we've taken a very simple rate function. We've taken it to be constant. Now, what happens if we make it adaptive? Well, uh, we can take it, for example, of the following form. This is a, a, um, a suggestion that happens to work quite well. And so, okay, you, you do all of the analysis, um, and then you get a, uh, a, a time complexity of the following form. And uh, this results in, for Grover, the usual scaling that you would expect. And for the quantum linear systems problem, this also gives you the optimal scaling. Uh, and again, right, so this is a time complexity, but you can then do the extra exercise of, of like of doing optimal Hamiltonian simulation on a quantum computer, and you will get that this is also the query complexity on a quantum computer. Um, another factor is uh, that you have um, so in this choice here, in the in the uh, suggestion that we've made of a possible rate, there is a certain amount of freedom with the queues here. Um, it turns out that we have to take the queue strictly between zero and one, and if you take it at zero and one. Uh, then you get an extra log factor. And, and we believe that that's more or less what's happening in the previous randomization um, attempt. Um, essentially, what was happening is that the queue was more or less taken to be one, which is why there was an extra log factor. Um, and and uh, uh, yeah. Okay. So a, a last point about scaling in the precision. So adiabatic methods kind of naturally have a scaling of one over the epsilon, but there are techniques to kind of circumvent this, uh, and they can also be done in this setting. So assuming you just have a device that can do this Hamiltonian simulation, uh, okay, we give a little bit of, of information on how you could, even with such a device that's not a full quantum computer, um, how you could do this eigenstate filtering. Uh, right, okay, that was basically it. Um, to conclude then, uh, so the main advantage of this method somehow is that it gives you continuous quantities, which seem to be easier to analyze in certain situations. Um, you, you can write down a generalized adiabatic theorem. Uh, we have given, so the optimal complexities that I've quoted um, essentially are of the form one over the minimal gap, which if you know something about adiabatic quantum computing, that's kind of 
better than you would generically assume, and that's because we've um, filled in an adaptive schedule uh, for the quantum linear systems. We obtain uh, the optimal uh, asymptotic scaling. Um, and so then, okay, what's the next step? Well, uh, one thing that I would be very interested in knowing more about is, okay, we've, we've got other discrete methods that we could randomize in this way. So for in, in particular, the discrete adiabatic theorem, I'd be very interested to know whether there, uh, you can analyze it in a different way using these differential equations. Maybe there are insight to be gained there. Um, also, of course, other applications would be very interesting because these two applications have been well studied. We know a lot about them, but you know, maybe this because the strength here is somehow that this automatically, given an eigenpath, this automatically gives you an algorithm. You don't need to know much else. You know, you need some spectral guarantees, but that's it. Um, so, uh, can we think of other applications? And we have some results that that these things work relatively well for rising Hamiltonians. Um, and then finally, like. Okay. The scaling has happened in terms of the gap, but sometimes the gap might not be the optimal measure with which to work. And so we're thinking, can we deal with a sort of effective gap, just like you could potentially do in some cases for the adiabatic theorem. So yeah, that was basically it. Uh, thank you. So we have time for one or two quick questions. Hey, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, actually realizing it in terms of oracle calls to block encoding of the Hamiltonian, because that that's something that tends to be a bit of a bit tricky when you're doing this uh, continuous time versions of these. So, um, like in principle, it's it's relatively easy, right? Because we have. Um, algorithms on, on the quantum computer, we have algorithms for optimal Hamiltonian simulation. So in principle, all you need to do is, you know, you, you take your Poisson process, you, you fix at every point, you fix your random time, and then you fill that in in the algorithm and that, that uses the block encoding. And so you can do that. And we, we've done the, uh, the exercise in the paper and you see that the scalings are exactly the same. So the query complexity is the same as the time complexity. Okay. Like you, you have to do something slightly complicated with the Q factor that I mentioned. Like not all of the Qs work equally well, so there there is a bit of a trade off. But like basically everything typically works out well. Okay. Okay. So maybe let's postpone the remaining discussion for the later. And thanks again for the nice talk.